Um, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well, and um, I hope you have already started um, preparing for our next session, inshallah. Um, in this session, I am going to um, discuss with you Edgar Allan Poe's poem, A Dream Within a Dream. Um, of course, things would have been a lot more different if we were on campus discussing this uh, together. But I'll try my best, you know, to highlight the most important ideas and the most important um, literary devices that um, have been used by Edgar Allan Poe um, in this poem. So before I indulge into um, the poem itself and uh, trying to um, provide um, some insight into the poem by highlighting the main um, literary devices, the main symbols and uh, um, the main sound devices used in the poem, I'd like to give you a very, very short um, introduction to Edgar Allan Poe, one of the major, uh, not only poets, but also um, short story writers um, in American literature. And actually, he is uh, regarded as the, um, the, the writer who um, started uh, detective fiction itself. Um, he's, he's very, very famous, and this is how he looks like, you know. And because of uh, how he writes and what he writes about, you know, there's this uh, skull... Um, most of his poems are really um, dull, they are sad, and they are full of madness. You know, not a very nice start. So it's really good that we started with a dream within a dream uh, with a pre-recorded session. Um, anyways, this is Edgar Allan Poe. He was born in 1809, died in 1849. Um, his mother died during his youth, and his father abandoned them. After the death of his grandmother, he married his 13-year-old cousin, Virginia, in 1835. Um, she died in 1847, and he died two years later, um, in 1849. He really loved his wife very much, and that is why in most of his poems and most of his stories, there's always, you know, um, this feeling of loss and this feeling of, um, of emptiness, um, specifically after the death um, of his wife. Um, uh, one of his major poems, uh, The Raven, he's really so sad and throughout the poem he laments the death of his wife and, you know, the idea here is that his own speakers are always um, a bit mad and they are always um, delusional. They don't really know whether um, this is real or this is um, imaginary, you know, in their own heads. And I think the speaker in today's poem is also suffering from um, the same problem. Um, Poe enrolled and dropped from uh, both the University of Virginia and West Point. He then ran into debt and started borrowing money, gambling and getting deeper. Um, into that until, as we said, he actually died in 1849. Um, his writing style in general, in his poetry and in his short stories too. So mainly he is a writer of Gothicism. His style is Gothic, uh, mainly deep and intense, deals with explorations of a world of dream and nightmare. Um, again, I think in uh, the poem we will be um, reading together, uh, he really talks about the idea of dreams and whether his whole existence is illusory. Um, you know, he starts to question here the reliability um, of his life, whether he is really alive or whether everything that happens um, is happening and will happen is actually a dream within a dream. Um, in his stories, the past is dark and ominous. He's actually one of the major writers of uh, American dark um, romanticism. You know, if you are um, into reading about, you know, suspense and madness and, you know, supernatural ideas and things of the sort, um, you will really be very happy if you started reading for um, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, the characters that he draws are filled with madness because he's always obsessed to unravel the irrational side um, of the mind, right? So a lot of crazy things and a lot of mad things, you know, which is perhaps why I always I am intrigued um, to read his own work. 
Now, um, let's begin, you know, um, the poem itself, okay? Um, a dream within a dream. Now, as you see, the poem is divided into two stanzas. Um, I'll be talking about the form and the structure, the meter and the rhyme scheme and everything, but let me first of all um, read um, the whole poem to you, okay? Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow. You're not wrong, who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet, if hope has flown away, in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all what we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Right. Um, as we said during the lecture, right, the, the first thing you have to do when you have a poem in front of you is actually to read it out aloud, okay? And this is what I did, all right? So you can read it once, you can read it twice, you know, just read it out aloud, right? And the second thing also, as we agreed, we try to get the meanings of the words that we don't know, we don't understand from a dictionary, right? Um, as far as I am concerned, I don't think that this poem includes any words that you, you know, that you feel unfamiliar, right? I think all the words here are... Um, you know, they are very clear, you know, what they actually mean. So, um, I'll be trying to um, interpret the poem from different layers, right? During the class, we talked about um, dealing with form, dealing with content, right? With form, we talked about the structure of the poem. We talked about the um, division, the stanzaic structure, how many stanzas, how many lines. We talked about also the rhyme scheme, right? The rhythm and the meter. Um, with, uh, with reference to content, we talked about the speaker, we talked about the theme of the poem, right? We talked about um, uh, the different literary devices that have been used in order to reflect the ideas that, you know, the poet wants to convey. We talked about um, figures of speech, we talked about the sound devices, we talked about imagery, we talked about symbols and motifs and so on and so forth, right? Um, before we start focusing on the um, on on the form itself, okay, I just like to more or less explain what this poem means, okay. Um, I.e., I will just try to paraphrase it, okay, so that you would um, understand what the whole poem um, is about, okay. Now, in the first line here. Okay, the speaker says, take this kiss upon the brow. Now, apparently, he's talking to, to someone, right? Um, who is this person? Is it um, his beloved? Is it, um, I don't know, I, I have no clue he, who he's talking to here. And I don't think it will be clear throughout the poem who he is really talking to. But apparently, he is addressing this to someone, right? In the first stanza, as we see here, so this is stanza one. And this is actually stanza um, two, right? In stanza one here in the first line, he is apparently speaking with uh, with someone. He's telling her or him, take this kiss upon the brow. And then he says, an imparting from you now, right? Now, apparently, he is leaving that person, right? They, they are about to part from each other. Um, are they parting because of a specific... Um, reason different circumstances or is it death for instance you know is this you know the the last kiss before the person you know is buried i just don't know right but apparently here because of the word parting right that the poet or no or we're going to deal with them as the speaker or the poetic persona is actually parting from another person all right and he says in parting from you now thus much let me avow, you know, let me tell you something, let me confess something to you, right? You are not wrong, right? 
you deem that my days have been a dream. Now, apparently, this other person that the speaker has been talking with, right, has told him before that, well, your days are nothing but a dream, okay? Your days are a dream, and apparently, the speaker confesses that, yes, you were right. My days have been a dream. Now, the, the, the trick here is what is the meaning of dream itself, right? Because this is mainly the main symbol or, the, you know, we're going to call it motif because it is going to be recurrent throughout the whole poem. So um, usually when you uh, you say the word dream, it is supposed to be nice, right? We, we, we ask uh, other people, huh, uh, what do you dream to be in the future? So apparently to dream something, has to be nice, you know, has to, um, um, to, to, to appeal to something beautiful in the future, to, to achieve something, you know, to feel happy about something. And that is why we do have another, you know, uh, word that contrasts with the meaning of dream, which is, you know, nightmare, right? A nightmare is a horrible dream, something that you feel so scared of. But here, you know, um, a dream, I, I, you know, the, the reader might really feel that, you know, it, it doesn't really carry that um, uh, kind of a beautiful or hopeful connotation for um for the word itself, right? Uh, actually, he starts with the idea of loss, the idea of parting from someone, and that someone used to tell him that your days have been a dream, right? So, um, uh, could the word dream have another meaning here? Um, could it mean that it's not real? Because always when we say, um, dream versus reality okay so when you're dreaming this means that you're not really awake okay you're you're sleeping and you're seeing something that is not real now uh, the idea is highly philosophical here um it deals with the idea of uh, uh, reality versus illusion is what you know again you know you you need to consider what the word dream means here because um um, you know, when you read the poem, you don't really feel that uh, uh, the word dream has, you know, uh, a nice connotation, more or less. So that person used to tell him before that your days have been a dream. And the speaker is confessing that, yes, you were right. Apparently, he used to say before that, no, my days are not a dream. But now he's actually saying, well, yes, my days have been a dream. And I confess to this. Yet, if hope has flown away, okay, now we're talking here about hope flying away, okay, hope like a bird has been flying away here. Now, again, it, it, um, it connects with the idea that dream here does not carry a good connotation because you're talking about hopelessness, that hope has flown away, right, in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone, right? Now, he's here talking about, you know, hopelessness more or less right uh, uh there's no hope in this world there's no um there's no happiness right and um as you you see he started asking you know uh, uh rhetorical questions here in the in the first sentence is it the for the less gone now he's not really waiting for us to answer it but he's just asking it you know in the form of a rhetorical question and then the last two lines of that stanza, he says, all that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream, as if, you know, it's more or less a conclusion that he arrived to, right? Um, he feels, uh, or he make, made us feel that he's so affirmative, you know? Yes, I'm 100% positive that all what we see or seem is but a dream within a dream, that all of this is an illusion. Our life is an illusion, more or less. Our life is, you know, it's nothing. It's, it's worthless. Okay, so um, this is the, the, the first stanza, right? And I'm not really in making any interpretation here. I'm just trying to paraphrase the whole poem to you, you know, to, just to let you understand, you know, what the, the, the poem is really about. In the um, next stanza, right, uh, there is a change or a shift in, in, in the setting itself, okay? I have no clue where the speaker was in the in the first stanza, but, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, you, of course you notice that the poem is full of visual imagery, okay? Now, apparently, I don't know whether the person he's talking to is, is on uh, her deathbed or something, or they are, you know, standing and talking together in a place where, you know, they are about to part from 
from one another but you know in the second stanza we are completely shifting to another place okay uh, this addressee he was talking to is no longer there in the second stanza and apparently our speaker is completely alone okay so i stand amid the row of a surf tormented shore right where is he he's at the beach okay um alone right and um the words that he decides to use here amid the roar you know the sound, the sound of the lion you know the roar of the lion you know so he, he doesn't feel happy he feels um he's suffering okay intensely all right of a surf tormented shore even the shore has is 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 being tormented here so you know the words that he decides his diction in the second stanza of course in addition to the first i'm saying that the first is beautiful but in the second stanza you get the feeling here that you know that the speaker is full of anxiety right um he's scared he's he's being tormented you know like the shore he's talking about so uh, again the second stanza the imagery here is is far more visual even than the first one because you can imagine a person standing next to the beach okay and since he's saying uh, a roar of a surf tormented shore then perhaps you can listen also to the sound of the waves all right and what is he doing and i hold within my hand grains of the golden sand okay another again visual imagery because you're trying to imagine the color of the sand and the speaker standing here you know at the beach and the sound of the waves apparently is you know is so high and he's standing there and with his hand he's holding some sand right and then he says how few you you know it's not a lot the sand that he has in his hand right yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep while i weep while i weep right so he has the the sand in his hand all right and they are actually slipping from his fingers right and they are going back they are going back to to to, to the beach itself they are going back to the sea right and says while i weep while i weep i need you to notice here the extensive use of the assonance in the uh, long eye okay how they creep my fingers to the deep while i weep while i weep uh, the repetition of the whole phrase while i weep you know would make you feel that even though you know the, the sand slipped through his fingers you know very quickly but it it took some time in his hand as if it was difficult the idea of letting go of the sand you know from his hand here you know and it it really tore his heart apart you know it started here with roar and tormented right and then here he says while i weep why he's he's crying right he's crying because of course by now you know that the sand is a, another major symbol in the poem here which reflects perhaps his life you know that his life is just slipping through his hand now it's it's the same idea you know when when you actually feel that um you know all of a sudden that you just grew up and uh you just start asking yourself you know what what how, what what did i do with my life my life just you know slipped through my fingers i don't know what happened you know i'm i'm now old um i don't know what happened that fast my life has just, you know, just gone too fast and you, you you start feeling so sad. You start feeling, you know, hapless about what really happened to you and you start thinking and going back and start thinking about what you did and about, you know, your life and what did you waste your life on? Was it really worthless living this life, right? And then he starts talking to, to God, right? We call this um, anaphora, right? He's, he's addressing God now. He's saying, oh, God, right? can i not grasp them with a tighter clasp another rhetorical question talking to i telling him i can't really i can't really keep hold of them of of the sand which i am telling you that this is what i feel right what i feel is that the sand is a symbol of his years of of his life his entire life that he feels are actually wasted that he actually lost without you know thinking you know they're just you know lost you know years just go by and you know you start asking yourself what, what what did i do you know with this life 
Again, he talks to God again, another anaphora. Can I not save one from the pitiless ways? Right? Another rhetorical question, because of course you cannot. You cannot save one sand. It's it's impossible. It's implausible, right? So it's, can I not save one from the pitiless ways? Of course, the description of you know a wave as being pitiless here is is a personification which entails that the waves are ruthless. They are the ones who destroyed, you know, the sand. But of course, it's not true because waves do not do not just you know challenge the existence of the sand but the waves are there because that's what they do you know this is just life and then a repetition complete you know we call this a refrain right because these two lines are the same there right if we go back to stanza one it says all that we see are seen as but a dream within a dream and then here in in stanza two right it's the same right but it's a question this time is all what we see or seem but a dream within a dream? All right. He's, he seems here more doubtful. Is it really a dream? Right. At the beginning, he, he was just positive. You know, it's, it's more or less in the affirmative. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. But then in stanza two, it turned into um, a question, which entails here that our speaker is becoming more and more doubtful about his existence, about the futility of his life, you know, that he's becoming more and more isolated from from the world, of course, specifically after, you know, the fact that he parted from whoever he was really talking to um, in stanza one, okay? Now, uh, while I explained the whole poem to you, I think I highlighted certain um, figures of speech and certain um, imagery, certain... Um, um, ideas and sound devices that are important in our analysis but I would like to um, start or focus more on the form um, of the poem oh my god I need to go back um, the form of the um, of the poem itself okay um, okay um, there is something about the poem here uh, with reference to the um, to the stanzas, right? The the stanzaic structures, right? Now the poem itself is divided into two stanzas. The first one has 18 lines, and the second one has 13 lines. Okay, we don't really have names for these. And I told you before that you know we have quatrain and couplet and octet and sister and whatever, but but actually having a stanza of 11 lines and the other one of 13 lines is a bit uh, complicated. And um, as I told you before, that the form reflects the content, and uh, there is always a connection between how the poem decides. Uh, I mean, how the poet um, uh, decides to structure his own poem and what he really wants to say what he wants to convey through the poem itself you know then apparently there is a reason why he decided uh, to choose 11 lines you know such you know I don't like odd numbers you know 13 lines another odd number you know um, for his poem here um, some lines there is a rhyme I'm going to highlight the rhyme scheme in a minute but you know 11 lines and 13 lines I want you to think of why you know would uh, the poet do this okay and i want you please to consider you know the speaker the feelings of the speaker the tone of the speaker um his own um mood while he was writing this because apparently uh, uh it, the poem talks about dreams but it it is just completely different from uh, uh, the word dream that you might think of okay it's not really a dream something that is happy something that you wish for but it's more or less a significance of the um futility of, of of an illusion that perhaps our life is an illusion that none of this is really worth it okay so perhaps you know his choice of 11 and 13 lines do really um correspond with you know his own unhappy um anxious you know mood throughout the poem itself um i'm not going to uh as i said during the this the, the class when i met you 
I'm not really going to um, focus um, on the on their rhythm and meter, but you know, in this poem, I'm just going to comment on two or or three things, and that's it. Okay. Now, um, every line in the poem, except line eleven, which is written I am Tramita, right? Uh, we talked about I am before, right? Unstressed followed by stress, unstressed followed by stress. Okay. And the tetrameter has um has eight uh, syllables. Okay, so more or less has four feet. Um, every line in the poem, except line 11, contains three feet, right? Uh, six syllables. Uh, that is why we call it trimeter. And the prevalent foot of the iamb, okay? Stressed followed by unstressed syllables. Unstressed followed by stressed. I'm sorry, it's, it's written here. Um, it's wrong here, okay? Um, not the whole poem is written in iamb. Okay. However, this is just an example of the uh, iambic uh, trimeter, right? How few yet how they creep. Okay. How few yet how they creep. So I have six syllables here, which means I have three feet, and this is the iamb. Okay. Unstressed followed by stress. How few yet how they creep. Okay. So uh, we call this um, iambic trimeter. Right. However, some lines in the poem contain the anapist meter at the beginning instead of the iamb. Anapist has three feet. Uh, you can go back to um, the slides that I sent you earlier, but you know you don't really have to focus on that. Or I'm I'm just trying to tell you here that you know um, even though most of the lines in this poem follow the iambic trimeter, there are a lot of exceptions and a lot of irregularities, you know, uh, with reference to the meter of um, of the poem. Um, so as we agree, the metrical patterns in the poem are too messy, they are too confusing, and uh, Poe could have done that for two reasons. One, perhaps he didn't want the poem to have a monotonous tone, right? He didn't want it to be boring, but I don't think this is the reason. I think uh, that the main reason is that he wanted to reflect his unsettled state of mind. He doesn't even know whether his life is real or rather a product of his imagination. And therefore, you know, this had to be reflected in the meter itself. I cannot really um, feel confused right, and tormented with a specific idea in my mind, and then I decide to write a poem wherein everything's happy, everything is written in iams, you know, I have a regular beat, I have a regular meter, no, things really have to be a bit messy, corresponding with his own, you know, dream-like status. Um, not only do we have issues with the meter, but we also have issues with the rhyme scheme, right? So, so far, the division of, you know, the, in, in 11 line stanza followed by a 13 line stanza, this is so messy. The metrical patterns uh, themselves are so messy. And the third thing that is also messy is the uh, the rhyme scheme of the poem. The point is, I can't just go back, you know, to read the lines with you, but here we go. These are this is the rhyme scheme of stanza one. A A A B B C C D D B B. Okay, this is stanza one. And then stanza two, E E F F G G G H H I I B B again. Right? So um the the, the rhyme scheme is irregular here. And I think again that he's doing this because um, he wants to depict the confusion that he feels between dream and reality. So the, the whole form is confusing, corresponding to the confusion that the speaker feels throughout the poem, wherein he does not really know how to uh, differentiate between uh, illusion and reality. And of course, he wants us as readers as well to feel this kind of confusion. Everything is confusing with reference to the form of the poem. I chose this poem specifically because of its form, because of its, you know, irregular form, because um, I want you to understand that the form is really important with reference to conveying the meaning of the poem itself and, of course, reflecting the theme of the poem and the feelings of uh, uh, the speaker in the poem itself, right? So everything about this poem here with reference to its form is really highly confusing, okay? As I told you before, when you comment on that, you don't really need to say, well, here is the rhyme scheme and then stop talking. No, the rhyme scheme is blah, blah, blah. It's irregular, reflecting so and so. So there should be a connection here between 
the form and um, content as we said before. Um, as for the uh, major um, literary devices used in the poem, I think that I highlighted um, many um, uh, devices used. However, I'm also going here to um, refer to certain uh, uh, literary devices that I think are major literary devices um, in the poem itself. So first of all, the, the metaphor, the, the idea of, you know, the connection between life and um, dream. Right. Um, I think I, uh, with some sections, I didn't really refer to the conceit. You know, uh, I think I did it with the last week sections. Now, what is a conceit? A conceit is an extended metaphor. What is the meaning of extended metaphor? It means that it it has been used many times in the poem. So it doesn't only appear once, but it becomes extended. You know. In the rest of the poem. Now the whole poem itself is based on this metaphor, you know, that life is nothing but a dream. Now, as I told you before, the trick here lies in the fact of what a dream is, okay? That is why I think I told you before that it is essential to um, get the meanings of some of the words uh, from a dictionary. Now I understand that the whole poem doesn't really have um, any problematic uh, words, but I think here that we need to get the meaning of dream from a dictionary, right? Um, um, I decided to choose Merriam-Webster dictionary, right? And perhaps we can read the meaning of dream here. It says, a series of thoughts, images, or emotions occurring during sleep. Okay, this is one. Two, an experience of waking life having the characteristics of a dream, all right, and he says, um, like, visionary or something, okay, B, a state of mind marked by abstraction or release from reality, 3, an object seen in a dreamlike state, 4, something notable for its beauty, excellence, or enjoyable quality, Five, a strongly desired goal or purpose, or something that fully satisfies a wish. Now, of course, if you if, if you look at some of the definitions that come later, like for instance, um, something that satisfies a wish or a desired goal or purpose, or something that is notable for its beauty or something of of, of, of that sort, I don't think that the word dream in this specific you know poem would refer to something beautiful like that. So I think you know um. I, I would go for a state of mind marked by abstraction or release from reality. And and therefore, we are dealing here with a, a conceit that is used to reflect the speaker's existential crisis. He has a problem related to his own existence. He is not really fully aware whether his life is real or is illusory whether he is really aware of what's happening around him, whether he exists, you know, in, in the first place. And that is why from the very beginning I told you here that the whole poem, you know, deals with a, a philosophical concept of, you know, reality versus um, illusion. <coughs> or actually what is, <coughs> what is real, you know, um, is this um this could be a result of him parting from his beloved uh, perhaps he's beloved perhaps he's referring to his wife you know i told you before that his wife uh, virginia died perhaps you know he's referring here to, to to his um to his beloved and he started um feeling uh, at loss feeling that you know he lost something very important in his life and that is why he started questioning you know, the um, the importance um, of his, his being, the importance of, of his life uh, in, in general. But, you know, the, the main conceit, and again, the word conceit refers to an extended metaphor, right, uh, that the poem is actually built on is the idea of life and dream, you know, this uh, comparison between life and dream. Right. Um, he uses a lot of personification also in the poem. I remember the pitiless waves, um, um, and and I think there are other examples too. And uh, when he 
uses personification in the case of the waves here, is actually describing them as people whose ruthlessness led to the demolition of the golden grains of sand, right? As if <coughs> waves, you know, are people who destroyed uh, the, the sand. And uh, the sand, as I said, is one of the major symbols in the poem, and it does really refer to, to his life. It does refer to the years of of his existence, and since the waves here are personified, then perhaps he is, I don't know, blaming people for, 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 for making his life worthless, or for making his years just go, go by, you know, like a dream, very quickly, that he couldn't even realize that he's actually, you know, growing older, or that, you know, his life is, is slipping through um, his own fingers. I need you to look at the poem again. I need you to to figure out other figures of speech that you think are important. We um we agreed before that you shouldn't you know uh, comment on every figure of speech used in the poem. You're actually commenting on the major figures of speech there, right? So that you would explain why the poet himself decided to use this figure of speech in order to convey his own content. Okay, so the two examples that I have written um, there and the other examples that I have highlighted when I was reading the poem at the beginning, you know, um, I could find explanations for. I could actually tell you that, you know, this is a major uh, metaphor, you know, this is a major conceit in the poem, or this is important because he he believes that the ways are with the human beings and so on and so forth. So I need you please to go, to go over the poem one more time and uh, try to to get me some figures of speech. I'll be asking you questions about that, you know, when I see you next week, inshallah. Right. Um, as for the imagery, as I said again uh, when I was reading um, the poem, uh, uh, many image, uh, images there are visual. I think um, he wants us to, to visualize things. And of course, there are auditory images too. Right. But for me, I, I, you know, in my mind, you know, I can see the speaker in the first um, stanza. For me, I think that his beloved is on her deathbed, for instance, and he feels sad and he feels, you know, he's mourning. You know, that is why he started questioning, you know, the, um, the importance of, of life in general, not his life in particular. And questioning the idea that, you know, life and, 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 and dream and reality and illusion are all intertwined, you know, at that moment. I think that when a person loses someone, he starts really to think about the, you know, um, his life in general. What did I do? Yes, you were right when you said that. Yes, you know, um, well, my life was worthless. I'm not really sure whether I'm here. I'm not really sure whether... Uh, this is real or this is an illusion, you see, you, you start to um, lose, you know, this uh, uh, connection with reality, you know, because you don't really want to believe that this, uh, you know, that this has happened, you know, specifically if, you know, like how I am um, interpreting the poem itself, that I really feel that we're dealing here with uh, a situation where, uh, he didn't only part from his beloved because he, he wanted to part from her or that she wanted to part from him, but because I think, you know, um, she died. If I'm going really to um, to encompass, you know, close personal life itself in the situation here. Um, in the second stanza, as I told you, um, I see the speaker himself, you know, standing by the beach and I can hear the sound of the waves roaring, you know, um, and him trying to, to, to have any kind of control of his life, you know. So, so his life more or less turned into these, you know, grains of sand that he tried to, to, to save, you know, from the waves, from the monstrous waves. So for me, you know, most of the images in, in this poem are highly visual. Um, again, I need you to go over the poem one more time. I'll be asking you, next week when I meet you, before we do the other poem, you know, if you have any more images um, that you um, you saw in the poem itself. Um, sound devices, I talked, I think, about um, um, assonance in deep and weep and creep. 
And I think I explained that in, in, in a way that, you know, we feel that uh, there is a very long time in our life, you know, we have a very long life, but then eventually we feel that it just, you know, just passed away very quickly, even quicker than we, we think. You know, and I think the, the, the connection here between life and and quickness and, and the fact that, you know, we feel that we are in control of everything and then eventually um, we realize that we don't have control over anything, um, you know, is um, a main motif in, in, in literature in general. Um, there is also the um, alliteration. If you remember, alliteration is the repetition of uh, the first sound. Okay, in... Uh, the dark sound in days and dream and deem. And I think it has to do more or less with questioning, you know, uh, life and reality and existence in general. And uh, I talked also about the, the refrain, which are the, the two lines um, at the end uh, is all what we see or seem um, is uh, about a dream within a dream. As I said in stanza one, it was more of a statement that he was so much, you know, uh, positive and, you know, affirmative about that specific idea. And then it turns into um, a rhetorical question, which indicates, you know, uh, that the speaker is now in more doubt. Um, he was a bit, you know, assertive before, but then he started, you know, doubting everything. He started doubting anything, you know, um, that he knows. As I said, the poem includes um, a major philosophical concept, which is, you know, um, reality and dream. But also, I think it has a more personal note, which uh, connects with the idea of loss itself and how a person feels that um, his life is not really worthless when he loses. I mean, his life is not really worthy if he loses someone that um, that he loves, uh, which is, I think, here uh, the situation with the speaker in post um, poem. Of course, we would have said uh, more things. I would have listened to what you think um, about the poem if we had this um, face to face, but. Uh, next week when I meet you, inshallah, I'm going to um, go over this poem again face to face. I'll ask you questions about it. And if you have anything that you want to, to add to um, what I said, I would be so happy listening um, to you. Right. And please, I don't want you to forget to prepare um, the road note taken by Robert Frost. Uh, this is what we will be um uh, analyzing together when we meet next week, inshallah. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope this wasn't boring, and I hope you would listen to this before I see you next week. Thank you very much.